Okay, I think I'll start. So this slide has got nothing to do with my presentation, but I liked it. What I'm actually going to talk about is secure payment architecture. So the um, chip and pin system and topics around that. So many of you will be familiar with the chip and pin system. Uh, this is what the EMV protocol is known in the UK, but the EMV protocol is deployed pretty much worldwide now. Um, you'll find it um, in smart cards used in almost every country, the major exception being the US, um, although that is in the process of being changed. The US is deploying the chip and pin system there, although they'll probably call, call it something different. They are interested in it for two reasons. Um, the first one is Americans traveling abroad, because now that chip and pin is dominant across the rest of the world, if you end up with a card which doesn't support it, then you might not be able to actually use your card in Europe. And the other reason is the cases like um, Target. So this is a US company which was breached. A whole load of card details were taken and then used for fraudulent transactions. This is possible because once you've got someone's card number, you can do mag stripe transactions or uh, transactions which are emulating a MagStripe only card. The UK is an interesting case study for a couple of reasons. One is that it was an early adopter of EMV, so they were rolling out between 2003 and 2005. It became mandatory February the 14th, 2006. Um, decided to be a memorable day, memorable day. And it has changed quite a lot of things, but not always quite what one expected. So if we have a look at how cards are used in the UK, this will be quite useful for giving context because many people assume that the way the banking system works in their own country is the way the banking system works in every country, and that's just not the case. Um, although, and although the EMV protocol is almost universal, the use of EMV varies quite a lot. So before chip and pin was introduced, um, the cards in the UK had a, a mag strip on it, which stored a, a copy of the card details. And at the ATM, you typed in your PIN. Because the card was just a, a dumb storage of data, it wasn't able to check the PIN, so the PIN was sent back to the bank to be verified. At point of sale, they assumed that many point of sale devices would not have the ability to communicate with the bank, and so the signature, you would sign a bit of paper that would be verified against what was written in the bank you, back of your card. If it vaguely matched, or even if it didn't vaguely match even at all, the transaction would be accepted. But after chip and pin, things changed. So the cards had this chip added, um, and the terminal would try to use the chip, if possible, to, to verify whether the card um, was going to be a genuine one. Um, then at the ATM, things basically didn't change. Uh, the pin was still used. The pin was um, going to be sent back to the bank for verification. But the major change is that um, at point of sale, the pin does get used for verifying. There's no longer the check of a signature. There's no real difference between credit and debit cards in the UK. Um, there's also no ID check performed at point of sale. That would be considered quite offensive to do in the UK because there's no national identity system in the UK. But when you look at this comparison chart, there's really two changes. The first is that PIN is now used more often than it was. And the second, is that the card is verified as to whether it's genuine using the chip. And these two effects are often conflated. The other reason that the UK is interesting is that it's got quite detailed fraud figures. So if we have a look at the fraud um, in the UK over the past few years, uh, this is all the data that we have at the moment. Um, so 
One type of fraud is um, card not present transactions. Um, this is by far the dominant type of fraud. Um, it was going down a little bit. It's just gone up in the last year that we have figures. Um, that's not affected by EMV at all because the chip is not involved. Um, what EMV was designed to do was reduce counterfeit fraud where someone makes a fake card and reduce loss and stolen fraud. And what's interesting is that um, counterfeiting went down initially, but then it actually went up. Uh, the reason it went up is people were able to bypass the chip and pin system and use their cards um, or use fraudulently generated cards in um, MagStripe compatible transactions. Uh, loss and stolen was going down already and it's continued to go down although it went up a little bit in the next year. So the chip and pin has had an effect um, but it's not been a, as pronounced an effect as was hoped and that's why there's been some questions about whether it was cost effective to deploy chip and pin at the time it did. And although the US is getting a lot of complaints for being slow to move out to chip and pin, it might actually have been the correct thing for them to do uh, from the perspective of reducing the costs, although probably not from reducing fraud. It probably costs about two billion pounds to deploy chip and pin in the UK. Um, but half of that was for the banks and half of that was for the people who accept cards, um, the merchants. And this was quite expensive for them. And the way that it was actually encouraged to do the deployment of chip and pin was through liability engineering. The, the, this was performed by changing who's responsible for fraud. So if we have um, up here, what type of card has been issued. So that's the responsibility of the issuer bank. Along the top is the type of terminal that's been used. That's the responsibility of the um, merchant bank and the merchant. And this chart shows who's responsible for the fraud. So issuer means it's the issuer bank. In practice, they'll pass that on to the customer. Um, the acquirer means the acquirer bank. And in practice, they'll pass that on to the merchant. The banks have got a lot of money. The reason they've got a lot of money is they don't give it away to anyone. So you can take a few examples. So for example, if the issuer has rolled out a chip and pin card, but the terminal can only do MagStripe, then the acquirer takes responsibility for it. Um, but if on the other hand, the card is um, chip only, but the terminal supports chip and pin, then the issuer has to take responsibility. And so that gives an incentive for everyone to move to chip and pin as quickly as possible. Um, but in fact, the banks were able to move much more rapidly from, than the merchants. So in practice, the merchants had to accept most of the costs of, of fraud. The reason that counterfeit fraud still went up is that the MagStripe system was not turned off when chip and pin was rolled out. It was left on and as a result, criminals were able to make um, cards which only had a mag stripe, even though the original chip had card details um, which said that this was a chip card. The second thing that made this easier is that the chip had a full copy of the mag strip. This was done because it would simplify the ease of deployment um, for the bank because if they were unable to process a chip and pin transaction they still had a copy of the mag stripe in the transaction and then could send this onto their old systems and then process it if this was a mag strip transaction but that caused problems because criminals were then able to record these card details and i'll show how that was done a little bit later um, even once the MagStripe fallback was turned off in the UK. Criminals simply moved abroad. Um, nowadays, they move to the US, but they've moved around lots of countries in the past. So in that respect, chip and pin didn't improve things as much as was hoped. But in some cases, things actually got worse because now criminals were able to get cash. They would collect card details by doing a double swipe 
Um, so they would swipe the, the card on the normal machine and then swipe it underneath the table. Um, this is CCTV footage from um, a criminal who would, um, with his other hand, use a second mag strip reader in order to collect the card details. And then they just watch the pin that you were entering. It's no longer being entered in at a secure ATM. It's being opened in a crowded supermarket with people looking at you. So now someone has got the card details, which they could probably get anywhere, but they've also got the pin. So they can now go to an ATM and get cash. The other thing that went wrong is that these terminals are supposed to be tamper proof. Um, that's how they're termed. In practice, that's not actually going to be possible. Um, um, in, in practice, all that's possible is that these things are going to be tamper um, evident or tamper resistance. And the level of tamper resistance that was required was actually pretty high. They said that in order to use, um, in order to tamper with a chip and pin terminal and successfully get the card details, then it should cost $25,000 per individual PED. And that's quite a very high degree of tamper evidence, um, but still that was what the, the banks decided. But then it raised the question of, are these terminals actually as tamper evident as they're supposed to be? So we had a look. We bought a few off eBay. You can still find these. Here's one of them. This is the, the back of an Ingenico i3300. And up here, you've got a switch. And then the switch touches this raised platform and pushes the switch down. If you try to take the back off the pin entry device, then it should deactivate itself. So that protects the back. If we now look at the front, here you've got um, four little pads. So these are just like the pads that you get in a normal switch, except they don't touch normal contacts on the printed circuit board, they touch these things. So when the lid of the pen entry device is down, it will make contact between these two halves and then it, the pen will be happy. But if you lift up the front of this, the contact will be broken and the pen will stop working. The reason these contacts have got this gold layer around the outside is to stop someone injecting conductive ink in order to short that out because that would be one way of defeating the tamper resistance. Um, what would then happen is it's quite likely that it will touch this outer layer and if either of the top or the bottom of the switch contacts touches the outer layer, then it will consider itself as being tampered with. Here's a close-up of the switch. Um, this is a switch that's pushed down. It's got a similar gold layer around the outside in order to detect the silver ink attack. And it's also surrounded with this... Um, labyrinth maze of contacts, if you drill through that or short that out, it will detect the tampering. On the PCB itself, we've got a similar labyrinth layer in between these two layers. But can anyone spot the problem with this picture? So say you want to get from one side to from the other side. Now, you either have to get a drill, which will go between the gaps of that, which is much, much less than a millimeter. What's the other way of getting through that printed circuit board? No one? Maybe it's too obvious. It's the great big hole up there, which they've helpfully left in the circuit board, which completely defeats the purpose of this tamper protection layer. We can go into another one. This is where the CPU lives um, on the same terminal. This is wrapped up in this tamper protective layer. Um, again, if you break this or cut it open, you'll be able to um, cause the um, CPU to self-destruct. But in fact, there's a few problems with this. And we did a demonstration for television. And here's a, a short clip from a video that we did with BBC Newsnight. Advantage, we were told, was that it had such good security protection. How could anyone steal from us 
If only we knew the numbers which would make our power function. As Susan Watts reports, it seems we were naive. By the way, while we were filming this piece, our cameraman fell victim to the fraudulent withdrawal of a thousand pounds from his account by someone in Serbia. So what we demonstrated there was putting a paper clip, um, in this case through one of the plastic layers, and then through one of these small holes on the printed circuit board onto the communication line between the card and the terminal. The, in most cards, as they're used in the UK, the copy of the mag stripe is sent over this communication line in unencrypted form. Um, as is the pin as it's sent to the card for verification. So this gives you all that's necessary to make a fraudulent transaction in an ATM and get out cash. Since then, um, partially as a result of this work, things have improved a bit. The card now no longer contains a full copy of the mag stripe. Um, it's replaced the three-digit CBV, which is on the mag stripe. This is similar, but actually different from the one that's printed on the back um, with a one that is specific to um, chip transactions. So if someone takes chip data and uses it as a mag stripe, it should be rejected. Um, although when we've tested that in the UK banks, they still accept transactions with the wrong CBV. Um, and the other thing that's happened is that tamper resistance of terminals has improved, but still nowhere near the levels that are necessary in order to pass the certification. So this was quite a problem. Um, it was particularly a problem in petrol stations in the UK. Um, the people who were um, quite often setting up petrol stations had their family threatened um, by and people who are affiliated with the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka and ordered to put devices onto the chip and pin terminals to record these details. Initially, they were relatively unsophisticated. Um, they would log the data and then have to be physically removed. The more clever ones had cell phones built in and they were installed at some point during the production of this device. So you buy your device, your chip and pin terminal, exactly through the way that you'd expect 
but it comes with a bugging device built in, probably in, on top of whatever one the NSA added as well. And this then sends the data back over the cell phone link. And the first time that these were actually spotted in the UK was from uh, an, a very alert security guard noticed that he was getting mobile phone type interference on his um, personal stereo when he went near one particular chip and pin terminal. He thought this was odd and reported it, and then this tapping device was found. Um, so now the instructions for using a chip and pin terminal is that at the beginning of the day, you should weigh it to make sure it weighs the same as the specification said, because that's the only way to feasibly detect the more sophisticated bugs. In some ways, this is a little bit unfair on chip and pin, because the car that is being produced does not have a chip. This is a, a fake MagStripe vulnerability. But there are other vulnerabilities in chip and pin. So to describe this a little bit, I need to introduce a bit of terminology. There are three stages to an EMV transaction. The first is card authentication, where the card proves whether it's legitimate or not. This happens um, by some public key crypto exchange. Uh, that's followed by card order verification. So we now reckon the card is good, but is the person presenting it a real, is the person presenting it the legitimate card holder, or has he stolen the card? So that's what's done there. And that's normally done with using a PIN, but not always. And then the final stage is whether the transaction should actually go through. And this is done using symmetric cryptography at the moment. And quite often the bank which issued the card will actually verify whether there is enough money in the account, as well as checking that the card was operating correctly. A little bit of terminology are the various players in a card transaction. So first of all, you've got the card holder. So they hold the card. They're the people in, in person entitled to hold the card. They deal with the issuer bank. This is the person that you get your credit or debit card off. Um, then there's also an acquiring bank, um, which is likely going to be quite a separate bank. Might even be, even if it is the same bank as the issuer, it's probably a different division. So in order to communicate, and more importantly, in order to put contracts in place so that they can deal with money, the payment system network, so MasterCard, Visa, Amex, JCB, um, allow the issuer banks to communicate with all the acquiring banks and sort out disputes. Uh, so you can look at um, the card schemes um, like MasterCard and Visa from a number of perspectives. The technology perspective is that they run switches which um, got, get issuers to talk to acquirers, but probably a more correct way of looking at them is that they are a big filing cabinet full of contracts. That's actual value um, in MasterCard and Visa. That was the thing that they have to fight very hard to protect. Um, actually getting people to communicate is probably an easier part of their job. So when a purchase happens, um, well, before a purchase happened, um, the card gets issued to the cardholder. Then they want to buy something, they present the card to the merchant. The merchant talks to the acquiring bank, the acquiring bank might talk to the issuing bank, make sure that everything is okay. And then at some point later, um, the merchant will give the goods to the cardholder. Um, then probably the cardholder will pay the issuing bank, um, the issuing bank will pay the acquiring bank and then the payment goes back to the merchant. The actual order that money moves around varies a lot. Um, for, so for credit cards, typically um, the merchant will get paid before the issuing bank gets paid. For debit cards, it will probably be the other way around. So that's how the overall network works. But if we now um, zoom in to this area between the card and the merchant, then we get this figure. This is the exchange between the card and the merchant and the issuer. The acquirer is just pass passing messages back and forth, so I've left that out. First of all, the card sends to the merchant terminal the card details, so account number, um, CBV, expiry date, also a digital signature over some, but probably not all of this data. Then the customer types their PIN into the merchant terminal. The PIN is then sent to the card. The card checks whether it's correct or not. Um, the card also gets a description of the transaction, so the amount of money, 
whether it's a refund or um, a draw, uh, whether it's cash or goods. And the card then processes these, sends back a yes or no answer, <coughs> excuse me, and sends back an authorization cryptogram. If the merchant decides to go online, which it will do in most cases, this transaction and the cryptogram goes back to the issuer. And because the issuer and the card share a symmetric key, the issuer is able to check whether the cryptogram is correct. The other checks that they will typically perform is whether there's enough money in the account. So that's how things should work, but how do things go wrong? Here's a fairly old attack. It actually predates EMV, um, and this is the yes card attack. So I mentioned that the card is responsible for checking the PIN. Well, what happens if the card is a fake card? Well, what the criminal can do is then get this fake card to always say that the, a PIN is correct, even if it's the wrong PIN. So first of all, the criminal has to make a copy of the chip. Well, they shouldn't be able to do that, but it turns out that the digital signature stage of EMV has a few options. It's got the insecure way that's cheap and the secure way, which is expensive, so the banks inevitably went for the insecure way, which is cheap. And that is simply sending a static digital signature, the same one every time, back to the terminal, and the terminal checks this. But that's quite easy to copy. So you copy the digital signature, and then you program that a card can accept any PIN, and then you can now use this card as if it's the real one and type in the wrong PIN and do transactions. It will not be able to go online, however, because it doesn't know the symmetric key which is necessary to generate one of these authorization cryptograms. However, that's not a problem if you know that a terminal is not going to go online. And in some countries, particularly France, a terminal will not go online for low value transactions. So this works pretty well. So how this looks is that this fake card um, sends the correct card details, the correct digital signature, copied off the real card to the merchant terminal. Wrong pin goes back to the fake card and the fake card says everything's okay and here's a cryptogram. The issuer are not involved because the terminal has decided not to go online so this transaction will not be detected as a fraud. There are some ways to defend against this. Um, the main way is to force all transactions online. In the UK, almost all transactions are online. But the other way of doing it is dynamic data authentication. Um, there, in addition to the static digital signature, a random number is also generated by the terminal and sent to the card. The card has an RSA private key and it provides the corresponding public key and it signs this random number under the private key, sends this back to the terminal. Terminal checks whether the private key is valid, so it came from one of the payment schemes it knows about, and if it is valid, then it checks the digital signature. If the digital signature is okay, then there's a reasonable chance that this is the real card. Um, the other thing that's possible is to do pin verification online. That's not done typically at point of sale, but it is done at ATMs. So these yes cards will not work at most ATMs, certainly not in the UK. But there's still fun some vulnerabilities here. So we did a, another demonstration. Um, this time was um, with um, BBC One Watchdog, which is a consumer rights program. And this is in 2007. Banking code says it's up to the 
banks to prove that you have been negligent. If they can't, then they have to give you your money back. But that's not what's been happening. Since Chip and Pin came in, it's up to you to prove that you've done nothing wrong. Betty Tanner was in London when her card was stolen and £2,000 taken from her alliance and left her account. Apparently they have spent the money on an upmarket jewellers. And I felt devastated. I went into the bank and I asked them what I was going to do about my bills. And the young lady shrugged her shoulders and said, call you, you'll have to have an overdraft. I've never been in debt in my life. Never. Never owed anybody anything. Elias and Lester refused to reimburse her. She appealed to the financial ombudsman. The ombudsman said he felt that because the pin, a pin number had been used, that I was negligent. And he found the bank. I don't know how they came to this decision of not reimbursing me, because I have never used my card in an ATM, ever. And I have never written it down, and I have never given it to anybody else. The reason the bank takes such a hard line is because they assume chip and pin is unbreakable. But the banks are wrong. We know at least one way that chip and pin can be vulnerable. These Cambridge University researchers, Stephen and Saab, are about to show us that they can access chip and pin information from somebody else's card. Here's the victim, one of our team about to pay for his lunch. It's going to prove very expensive. In a bookshop a few doors down the road, Stephen is waiting to hijack his chip and pin details. He'll be using a fake card linked to a computer hidden in this backpack. Stephen has an accomplice. Saar is working in the cafe where he's tampered with the chip and pin machine. Instead of sending information to the bank, card details will be sent wirelessly to the computer in the backpack instead. Ready to go, Saar tips off Stephen in the bookshop, who's in position to make his own purchase. It's more expensive, but he doesn't plan to use his own money. The customer in the cafe keys in his pin to pay his five pound bill. As he does so, his chip and pin details are automatically sent to Stephen in the bookshop. He enters the hijack pin to buy his books. It's all gone through. Both the chip and the pin have been read by the terminal in the bookshop. The victim in the cafe thinks he spent five pounds. In fact, his card has been charged 50 pounds, but he won't be able to prove he didn't spend it. Okay, so what you saw there was the relay attack. So here we had um, in the restaurant a real chip and pin terminal. Um, so, sorry, this was um, in the bookshop was a real chip and pin terminal connected up to the bank and someone honest working behind it. Um, other, other hand, you had the honest customer who was in the bookshop thinking she was buying some books. But in between, you've got some contraption. The terminal is an evil terminal. This is one we bought off eBay, tampered with. And the customer puts their card into this. These are connected wirelessly um, to another computer, which is connected up to this fake card. And this fake card then gets put into this terminal. So this looks quite complicated. It takes about two backpacks worth of electronics. But you can really view it as a wire connecting this legitimate card up to the legitimate terminal. The only thing that we're tampering with is what the customer sees. So they think they're paying um, £20, but what they're actually paying is £2,000. And because we're not actually tampering with any of the communication between the real terminal and the real card, all these checks will be formed correctly. The digital signature, whether this is SDA, DDA, or the newer one, CDA, will pass. The pin will be verified correctly because the correct pin gets sent back to this card. So from the bank's perspective, this is as if Alice plugged her card into this terminal. And there's nothing that we can do just with crypto in order to defend against this. And this attack still works. In order to try to resist this, you have to be a bit more clever and one possibility is to use distance bounding protocols. The result of a distance bounding protocol is not just that you know who you're talking to, but also that you know um, how far approximately is the, are the two communication partners. So in this case, because of this delay introduced, uh, it would be possible for the terminal 
if it was running a distance bounding protocol, to know that the card is far away because it will only listen to responses when they're sent within a few nanoseconds of the challenge. And so far, this hasn't been deployed in any real systems, um, but one thing that has been done is some cards, um, not chip and pin <coughs> cards, but access control cards, have been tuned down so that they will be a bit more sensitive about how long responses are going to take um, before a transaction is going to be rejected. In the case of EMV, uh, you can delay responses by minutes and things will still work out okay. But that's not, again, a problem with the EMV protocol. Any normal security protocol will be affected. But there are some genuine vulnerabilities with um, the EMV protocol, at least how it's been implemented in most countries. And this is called the no-pin attack. The scenario that we're dealing with here is where a criminal has stolen someone's card and then wants to use it, but they don't know the pin. So they've got the right card, but not the pin. And this transaction will work for online transactions. So the acquirer is going to be contacted and even if the card is DDA. So again, we did a demonstration of this. Um, so we filmed this for BBC News type, um, this time in 2010. And here you can see a video of us doing it. The university gave us permission to see if the attack works in real life. The team set up in one of the university's cafeterias. We obviously don't want to give out too much detail, but in simple terms, Star is hooking up the stolen card to a chip. This is controlled from a laptop and runs software written by the team. All of this is hooked up to a fake card which slots into the actual shop terminal. The kit wouldn't have to be this big. The team's already working on miniaturizing it into a unit the size of a remote control. Saar has a trick up his sleeve. His dummy card has a concealed cable running up his arm to the kit in his backpack. So will it work? He doesn't need to know the actual pin from the stolen card. Any combination should do. The stolen card is getting a message that the purchase has been authorised by signature. This mismatch should allow the transaction to go ahead. And yes, it does. The printout states it's been verified by PIN. In fact, Saar tried a handful of high street debit and credit cards, keying in 0000 as the PIN, and it worked every time. The team tried out four common cards. Two credit cards issued by HSBC and John Lewis, and two debit cards issued by Barclays and the Co-op Bank. There was no particular reason for choosing these cards. They just happened to be the ones in the News Night team's wallets. The Co-op Bank said this is an industry issue which is not specific to the cooperative bank. Our chip and pin debit and credit cards are no different to that of any other provider. Barclays told us, whilst the prevention and detection of fraud is of course a major priority for Barclays, this is an industry issue and is not specific to any card, provider or bank. HSBC said, although they have raised a clear security concern with regards to chip and pin, which we're taking very seriously, the problem highlighted is relevant to all card issuers and not just HSBC. HSBC also administered the John Lewis credit card. The three banks referred us to the Banking Trade Association for for further comment. So you can definitely see that when it comes to security, the banks do work together. They all came out with roughly the same answer, um, which is that this was not something that was specific to any one bank, which was correct, um, because the UK banks have made a, a decision to not compete on security. Um, and so far, this has not been considered anti-competitive by the UK banking authorities. But going back to the technical detail of what's going on, um, here's the kit that we, we set up. Um, it's quite similar to that of the relay attack. And in fact, we, this is, took us about 10 minutes to make necessary changes to convert the relay attack into the no pin attack. Um, this is about five lines of Python. Um, what happens here is that the fake card 
is put into the merchant terminal. But now the fake card is actually wired up to the real card because we do need the real card to be present. The crook types in the wrong pin, 0000, zero, zero, zero could be anything. Um, this is sent to the fake card, but it is not sent to the real card. Um, then the fake card sends back the pin OK message. It has to come from the fake card because the real card never actually generate, saw the pin, so it's never going to generate a pin OK message. But the pin OK message is not authenticated. It's simply the number 9000 in hexadecimal. Um, but then the transaction continues, and now the real card comes back into play. So the transaction description goes to the fake card, sent unmodified to the real card. Um, the cryptogram comes back from the card, sent unmodified by the fake card, back to the merchant, back to the issuer, and then the issuer decides that this is OK. And because we've not modified the transaction description and we've not modified the cryptogram, when you verify the transaction against the cryptogram, everything will work out as OK. Now, there clearly has been something which has gone wrong. Why is the card allowing this transaction to proceed, even though it never saw the PIN? Well, that's because PIN is optional in EMV. The merchant can decide not to require the PIN, suppose the transaction is low value, um, or maybe the customer is unable to remember a PIN. So the card will still generate a transaction cryptogram up here if, um, well, basically under any conditions. It will signal back to the bank that the PIN has not been entered. So the bank knows this, the issuer knows this, but the issuer doesn't know what the merchant thinks. So the issuer sees that this is a, a signature transaction or a, no a, pin, a transaction with no PIN. The merchant thinks that the PIN is correct, but they never actually talk to each other enough to reliably determine that they've been tricked. And so far, this has worked in all UK banks that we've tried it on, although it seems that some banks are working on trying to develop patches against this. So why does this attack work? This should have been seen at the design stage. Well, in order to actually identify that this attack was present, you have to read well over 4,000 pages of specification. Some of these are secret. Um, EMV specifications themselves are not, but they just uh, are the toolkit for building protocols. The responsibility for actually building the protocol is up to the people who make the authorization systems, who make the cards, and who wire it all up together. And that's not something that is in the role of the EMV specification itself. All of the specifications also don't quite tie up together. Um, EMV is developed by EMV Co, MasterCard and Visa have got their own specifications. ISO got involved at some point and set some messaging formats um, for international standards. And then the UK Card Association, previously known as APAX, came up with their own standard based on those. And this means that there's no single specification that actually describes what checks should be performed. And there's also um, some problem um, with the messages which are sent back, um, where it says AGS, this should be, oops, where it said AGS, this should be flags. The FL ligature doesn't seem to have appeared properly. Um, there's a set of results that are sent back by the card, the card verification results, uh, and these are trustworthy because they are authenticated by the symmetric key between the card and the issuer. But that's issuer specific. So the merchant doesn't have any way of knowing what format this is and therefore is unable to check whether the card thinks whether the pin was correct. The terminal does know whether the, it thinks the pin is correct and that's stored in TVR, terminal verification results. But that is not always sent back to the banks. And even when it's sent back to the banks, it's quite frequently corrupted. When we talked to some banks about this vulnerability, they told us that they actually looked for evidence of this fraud happening. And they found hundreds, if not thousands, of cases. So they panicked and started investigating a bit more. And in almost all of these, the customer had not disputed the transaction. So it probably was a legitimate transaction, but for some reason, the flags that were sent back were incorrect, 
either because the terminal was misconfigured or the switches which were carrying the data were corrupting some of this. And this was never caught before because no one considered it important to look. So there are some ways of trying to defend against this and other vulnerabilities in chip and pin. Um, one I mentioned before was ICVV. This is replacing the CVV value on the mag stripe. Um, well, replacing the copy of the mag stripe on the chip with a version which has a different CVV in order to allow the bank to distinguish between a true mag stripe transaction done with mag stripe and a mag stripe transaction done with a copy of the data from the chip. The other thing that is now fairly um, well performed is disabling fallback. So nowadays, if you perform a mag stripe transaction using a card which should have a chip, there's a good chance it will be rejected unless you've already told the bank that you'll be in a country that doesn't support EMV. And then in order to prevent card details being taken, um, there are, are some efforts to prevent skimmers from being installed on um, point of sale terminals. So that's trying to defend against skimming. If we now look at the yes card attack, um, this probably won't work anymore. DDA is fairly well deployed, um, not so much because it's much cheaper, it probably is about the same price as SDA cards, but more because it's now fast enough to not slow down the queue in major supermarkets. Major supermarkets are very influential when it comes to deciding card standards. And if you tell them that they have to hire an extra thousand staff in order to deploy an uh, extra security mechanism, they'll tell you to go away. They'll tell you to come back when the new security mechanism is only a few milliseconds more than the old security mechanism. And that's also one of the reasons that the US has not deployed chip and pin. They're worried about how much slower transactions will be and how many more staff they'll have to hire to deal with them. And then no pin attack. There are some ways of trying to deal with this. It's not quite sure uh, whether these are going to work. Um, not because the specification doesn't allow them to work, but because implementations are quite flaky and the merchants are not really willing to play along. Um, as I mentioned, they had to deal with a lot of liability between the transition between MagStripe cards and chip cards because they were not quite as fast to move as the banks and they're feeling quite resentful. Now they've managed to push the liability back to the issuer and they are not willing to do any more upgrades for no benefits for themselves. And there have been cases where there have been bugs in terminals which have not been fixed and as a result issuers have had to deal with problems and they haven't been able to get the merchants to upgrade. So a few points. I mentioned about random numbers. Um, these are used um, both in the description of the transaction for generating the, the application cryptogram. They are also used during DDA, the dynamic data authentication. The challenge gets sent to the card and then the card comes back with a yes or no answer as to whether the transaction can proceed. So are these actually random? Well, through some circumstances, we ended up with some transactions which were being disputed, and we noticed that the unpredictable number was very similar for each of these transactions. So that's a little bit suspicious, but we only had um, four in this case. So we decided to do a bit more work. So we got a few ATMs off eBay. Um, these are relatively cheap if you don't have the keys for them, um, but the lock on them, um, so this little thing and that little thing can be picked in about 10 minutes if you know how. Um, these are not really designed to be in the open street, these are designed to be in shops. Um, and then you can pop them open and look inside and what you find out is that there's basically a PC in here. So there's a PC back here, this is its screen, um, this is the proper safe. This has got a serious key on it. We haven't been able to open this. Um, we don't think it's got money in, but that'd be a bit lucky if it does. Um, and then this thing is actually a hardware security module that has a keypad on the front. And this is responsible for taking the pin, encrypting it, and then sending it off to the bank for a verification. So this is really the only secure bit of electronics in here. Everything else 
is just a standard PC. This one runs OS2. And we've then got this hard drive, which we connected it up to an old PC we had lying around and copied the data off to get the code. This is actually quite a modern ATM, relatively. Uh, another one we looked at was from Triton. Um, this um, is uh, the I.O. chip, but this thing here is the CPU for this. And this is a Zilog Z80. I don't know if anyone used Spectrums. Um, so you could be using um, a Spectrum-inspired chip in an ATM today. Um, it also has some other chips. Um, this is um, this one here is a chip that does DES. Seems to actually only do single DES. We're not sure how they use it. Um, it's also got a, a battery backup. Um, and it turns out that this, despite its age, is actually generating plausible random numbers because the DES chip has also got hardware random number generator and it's not obviously broken. But we wanted to see a bit more modern ATMs and we couldn't really get those off eBay's because the, the bank doesn't put the old ATMs on eBay. So we made up this card. Um, so this is the back of the chip contacts. So this is the, the back of the gold bit that you see on the card. This is the actual silicon chip in here. It's much smaller and it's connected up to the six pads. Um, smart cards look like they've got eight pads. Actually, two are normally unused. So you actually only get six. And then we've connected up th this to a little microprocessor. Um, this has been sanded down, so it's about 0.5 millimetres thick. Cards are 0.7 millimetres thick, so once you shave this down, you can stick it on. And then this is a serial EEPROM and some glue logic. And the idea was that you put this into the terminal. The card, the chip which we have not modified, communicates with the terminal as normal, but we get a log of the transaction um, over the I.O. pin and the ground pin. And then you get a a long list of unpredictable numbers. So we started looking at them, and we found some strange things. Um, so this column is all zeros. So that's not what you'd expect from random numbers. We also saw some which were on, um, only increasing, and um, increasing proportional to the time. So they're either a counter or a timer. And then there was other ones which had very distinct patterns. Um, from talking to people in the industry, it seems that some of these um, ATMs have only got 16 bits of entropy in the random number generator. So if you just look at it again, it'll, you might well get the same number coming back. Um, point of sale terminals, oh, quick, from a quick look, seem a bit stronger, but we haven't investigated those as much. So why is this actually of any interest? Well, if you predict what a random number is going to be in the future, then you can use this for making a fake card. So you, first of all, get access to the real card. Um, maybe you're running a shop, and then someone puts the card in your terminal. Maybe you steal it for a little time. And then you perform transactions with this card, but you send the unpredictable number, which you know that you'll see in the future, from the real terminal. You might not get it perfectly correct, so you just ask for lots. Um, if you get a few hundred, then the customer probably won't notice what you're doing. Another possibility is that the terminal or ATM has got a good random number generator, but you have some malware which modifies the random number generator to make it worse, or you can use the tampering with the communication line between the terminal and the bank. So even though the ATM will generate a good random number, and it'll send a good random number generator to this fake card, you send the bad random number generator back to the bank. And even though the bank is relying on the number being random, it's got no way of verifying this. So here we've got a, an example of moral hazard. As I said in the economics talk, in order for a security system to be secure, it not only has to have all the properties that you want, but also the people who rely on something should have some way of controlling the properties. And in EMV, the bank does not have any way of verifying whether the supposedly random numbers are actually random. But then once you've got these predicted random numbers, you can then generate a fake card, which replays the response 
from, that was generated a long time ago from the fake card and then perform these transactions. There are some um, tweaks that you might have to do because each transaction has a transaction counter and there might be some ways of detecting this, but so far the checks the issuers are doing are not quite good enough to try to detect this vulnerability. What issuers could do if they wanted is look for jumps in the transaction counter. I mentioned that you might need to request a few hundred application cryptograms from the real card before you get one which will match the unpredictable number you're going to see. And that will mean that there will be quite large gaps in the 16-bit number that goes along with each transaction. Another possibility is to look whether issuer authentication is performed. This is an optional step. I mentioned that for online transactions, the issuer gets a copy of the cryptogram. They can also send one back. And if they send one, one back and it goes to the card, the card checks it and then records the fact that this has happened. But in the case of the pre-play attack, when the transaction cryptograms are being collected, the, the issuer is not aware of these transactions, so issuer will never perform this authentication stage. But a better solution is to take a lesson from security economics and having the issuer generate this unpredictable number. But this will require another round trip over the communication network. And if you've done any web design, you'll know how important round trip is to maintaining a responsive website. And if you're Visa and it's Christmas Eve in the US and you're not able to process enough transactions, because you're not enough, you're not generating unpredictable numbers quickly enough, then you'll be very upset about the money you're going to lose, um, both from failed transaction and fines as a result of it. So it's not too surprising that this choice was not made when designing the EMV protocol. We have reported this vulnerability to the industry um, back in 2012. Um, some people knew about the problem, some people were, were a bit surprised about it. Um, there has been some work on improving the specification for, um, for EMV to make sure that a random number generator, which is obviously bad, will not pass. Previously, the test for a good random number was you ask for three of them, and if they're all different, then that's fine. Um, that's not adequate. The new tests are a little bit better. You have to ask for a few hundred. You have to make sure that there's no single bit that's stuck in one position. Um, but it's still not as good as the tests that are done, for example, with FIPS for whether random number generators are any good. But that's about the flaws of EMV. But what can we try to learn from it? Well, one lesson is that when things go wrong, then security protocols might end up in court. So if you're going to build a system, not only must you ensure that the system works, but can you prove in a court, if necessary, that this system actually does work? Um, so here's a case where a customer has been on holiday and he's had his card stolen and some transactions appeared on the card. He said he didn't do them. He'd like a refund, please, under the Payment Services Directive. And the bank took advantage of the word necessarily, for those of you who were in the lecture this morning, and said that because their records show that the successful transactions were authorised with a genuine card and correct PIN, the customer is going to be liable. Now, there was no debate whether the correct card was used because the card was stolen, but the customer said he'd never told anyone his PIN, therefore he should not be liable for these transactions. Now, normally the customer would just lose at this point, but he was a bit lucky because the transaction was not in the UK, it was in Turkey, and receipts in Turkey are sometimes a bit more detailed. So here's the receipt and the sort of things that you'd expect. Um, but this is interesting. Um, this is various bits of EMV specific data. Now if we zoom into this a little bit, um, we'll see this thing. Um, this is the application ID. Uh, this is the first thing that you get when you do a card transactions. This isn't so interesting though, it just says whether it's MasterCard or not. Um, but this thing is very interesting. This is not something you get in most receipts. And this is the terminal verification results. This is the terminal's view of what's going on. And the interesting 
byte of this is the third one. So you've got 00, A0, 08. So remember 08. So to understand this, you have to look up the spec. Here is a selection from the EMV spec. So for those of you who know binary, um, if the first four bits are all zero, none of these, um, let's see if I've got this right. Yeah, none of these actually apply, um, but it as a second nibble means that this row applies. So out of all of these, this row applies. And this row says, pin entry required, pin pad present, but pin not, not entered. So that doesn't really make sense. The bank says that the pin was entered. The terminal says that the pin was not entered. What went on? Well, what likely happened is that this terminal was either tampered with or malfunctioned, and it would report back to the bank that the pin was correctly entered. The reason why this is of interest is because if the pin is correctly entered, then it then becomes the issuer's problem whether this is a fraudulent transaction, not the merchant. And because the bank is relying on what the issuer has said, rather than what the card has said, they believe that this is a pin authorised transaction. Um, so once I told this to the bank, the bank immediately backed down um, and the customer got very quiet. Quite often what will happen in these cases is that the bank will ask the customer to sign a non-disclosure agreement um, that what, even though they've got the money back, um, they're not allowed to talk to the press. And this is one reason why these cases um, don't end up in much more press. Um, I certainly don't sign these agreements, so I'm free to talk about them. So that's an example of why protocols should be able to generate adequate evidence. First of all, for working out what's going on, and secondly, if this customer did end up going to court, the bank would be in quite a bad position. Now, there has been research on how to design protocols to be good at producing evidence, comes under the field of non-repudiation, but some of the papers are a bit unrealistic. So here's an example. Um, I'm not picking on this pa paper in particular. Um, there's plenty of paper, papers that say something along the lines of this. And it says, the judge verifies whether blah is equal, is valid with regard to blah, and the cipher message provided various bits of crypto. Judges do not do crypto. Very few judges are able to do the sorts of maths that are necessary for doing crypto, and even if they did, they wouldn't have the time. Judges are generalists, they're not spe specialists. They're almost always very intelligent, but they need to have information explained to them, and that's the role of the expert witness. So if you've ever seen um, court dramas, then you can pretty much forget about it. This is not how things actually work in the real world. What will generally happen is either the court will appoint one witness, that's fairly common in Napoleonic law systems, um, or in Anglo-Saxon law systems, there will be um, an expert witness on each side, but these expert witnesses will work together and they will try to work out what matters are in dispute and what matters are in agreement long before the trial actually happens. So the important thing is to the security protocol should be able to convince the evidence, sorry, convince the expert witness what has happened so the expert witnesses can report to the judge their interpretation of the evidence and provided the two expert witnesses agree, then the court proceedings will be relatively simple and most of the work actually should happen before the court procedures actually go through. But quite often things go wrong and I've been an expert witness in a few cases where things have not gone as they should, normally because um, the other party, uh, whether this is banks or um, in the case of offender tagging systems, the people who manufacture these um, tags which maintain curfews, are not able to hand over data because they don't know it or they think it will compromise the security of the rest of the system and what will sometimes happen is the evidence will be thrown out of court and then one side will lose the case even though this was not what they intended to happen. So I've got a paper coming out in financial cryptography. Um, it's up on Light Blue Touch Paper, my blog now, which describes a set of principles that I think are very valuable to bear in mind when you're designing a system which involves any security component which might be come up at court. So the first is that 
the protocol should record evidence and everything should be able to be publicly disclosed. In one banking fraud case, the reason that the bank were not willing to hand over the logs of the transaction was because even though the customer's card had been, uh, had been cancelled, the key it used had commonalities with the keys which were issued to other customers. Now maybe that was a mistake, but that's what they did. And so they weren't willing to disclose the symmetric key needed to generate the application cryptogram, and so there was no way to verify it. So what they should have done is ensured that when this case comes up to court, they should be able to hand over everything, and they should keep everything. The other thing that happened was that the procedures for challenging chip and pin transactions had never actually been properly developed and certainly had never been tested. And that was another reason the bank were unable to disclose all the evidence necessary, because they said that the computer systems they were using were incapable of generating this. And when these cases have gone a bit further, the expert witnesses on both sides have had to do the best they can to make things up as they go along. And sometimes the results are not as um, ideal as you would hope. Really, the expert witnesses should all be working from a common set of rules which have been agreed by some overall body. The other problems that frequently happen is that systems are not properly described and the parts of the system which are necessary to be trusted in order to trust the results of the system um, are too complicated. Really there should be a small bit of code, the trusted computing base, which is all you need to know about in order to verify whether a transaction has happened properly, whether the protocol has been proved faithfully. You shouldn't need to know whether the marketing system for collecting logs is working. You shouldn't know whether the payment system is working. You shouldn't have to know about all of these different systems that are hooked up to the payment system in order to know whether a cryptogram is actually correct. Principle four is a little bit subtle. When a chip and pin transaction happens, there is this application cryptogram. If the application cryptogram is incorrect, the transaction should be rejected. Therefore, it doesn't actually add very much information to repeat the verification of the application cryptogram. In order for this transaction to have ever happened in the past, this verification must have been able to succeed. And if a criminal is going to try to find a way to commit fraud, they will ensure that this application cryptogram will successfully be checked. So this in itself is not so useful for verifying. All it does is tell you that the checks that should have been performed actually probably were being performed. And this is, has a disadvantage when you compare it to the old security system that involved signatures, people writing a mark on a bit of paper. Now, it was well known that signatures were not actually verified against anything. Um, if you sign Mickey Mouse on a receipt, then the transaction will probably go through without anyone noticing. But this is, in some cases, a weakness, but in some cases, an advantage. Because if a fraud does happen, there's no incentive for the criminal to make a good copy of your signature. They'll just scroll down anything. And therefore, when it comes to challenge a case, an extra level of checking can be performed, the receipt can be requested, and it will be obviously clear that this was a fraud. And it would be good to have this similar property when it comes to performing security protocols that involve digital signatures. There should be some other technique that is not used during the transaction itself, but is only used for dispute resolution. And this can be a bit more carefully designed because it's not subject to the same constraints as the thing that has to be used for EMV. It could even be issuer specific, so you don't, get, have, you don't have to get everyone to agree to it. But importantly, it should not be checked as a matter of course. It should only be checked in the case of dispute resolution. And then when disputes come up, this additional check can be performed. There was no incentive for the criminal to, um, to actually 
spoof this check at the time, so there's a reasonable chance that that check will fail, and then that will inform the bank that there is a way of performing fraud they, they haven't found about, and then they can do more investigation. Then the, the final request, um, the final principle, is that the protocols, um, well, the, the procedures for investigating disputed payments should be regularly reviewed and they should be controlled by whoever is regulating the system. We have reported to the UK financial regulators that more should be done in dispute resolution and the response um, to us was that they didn't have anyone who understood, understood computing well enough to understand any of our papers and therefore they weren't going to do anything. They were getting all their technical expertise from the banks and therefore it's not too surprising that what they got back was fairly one-sided. So in conclusion, I've described a number of ways where EMV fails. This is interesting if you're involved in EMV, but you should also look out for these types of vulnerabilities in systems that you're building or systems that you're using. Some lessons that have come up is that EMV's complexity has been quite a serious problem um, when it comes to making sure that it, it works securely. And in particular, only dealing with the specification as a means of maintaining compatibility rather than also maintaining security has meant that it was not possible to just look at specification and identify these flaws that have now been seen and in some cases been seen in the wild being carried out by criminals. In order to try to fix this, we can patch up the specification, add some bits that we need, but really there's some systemic issues with the EMV protocol and at the very least it needs to be dramatically shrunk and possibly rewritten if it wants to be something that um, is now going to be considered a, a good thing that um, should be used in, in other countries and some of this is in the process of being done. And I've got something about online banking um, which I haven't talked about so much but that is a nice lead for my talk tomorrow morning. And if you want to lead out, um, read some more on this, then that web page is a link to um, the work that is being done in my group. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Is that always transmitted in every transaction? Uh, yes. So that yep. basically would not have prevented the, the fraud or the, the compromise of targets? Um, maybe. Uh, the reason is because of the ICVV men, uh, system I mentioned, in that the copy of the mag stripe that's stored on the chip may be slightly different. It may have a different CVV, but... but that's Yes, so the issuer may not actually check that. And in some cases, US issuers were not actually checking the CVV. So no, it, it might not have actually helped in that case. What would help is turning off MagStripe, but that's only something that you can do once almost all the terminals have been upgraded and almost all the cards have been upgraded. And that's going to take maybe a decade in the US. Anyone else? Okay, well, thanks. <laughs>